I want to introduce a wonderful friend, John Maxwell. He's num or num number one New York Times bestseller. He sold over 30 million books in 50 languages. He ranked the number one leader in business and the most influential leadership expert in the world by Business Insider and Inc. Magazine. He's founder of the John Maxwell Company, the John Maxwell Team, Equip, EQUIP, and the John Maxwell Leadership Foundation. He speaks to Fortune 500 companies and to presidents of nations, the world's top business leaders every year. He's been a donor here to Liberty in recent years. He and Elmer Towns have been best friends for how long? Since 1974. And so, um, of course, Elmer's our co-founder. Give him a hand, too, please, if you would. <laughs> Elmer is constantly sending me email messages just to encourage me. Appreciate that. Anyway, welcome to Liberty, John Maxwell. Thank you very much, Jerry. Good morning. Let's sit down, and just get acquainted for a moment, and then I'm going to teach away. My name is John. On the count of three, give me your name. One, two, three. John. Nice to meet you. I'm very excited to have this opportunity to share with you because um, you're young people with incredible potential and a future that can be incredibly bright in your life. And I would like to just talk to you today about how you can make a difference. Because I think all of us dream of, of making a difference, and you're young, and you have your life before you, and, and, and you have dreams in your life. And I would like to just take one passage of Scripture just for a moment. It's, it's in the passage of Daniel, and it's about Daniel, who was young, and, and the difference that he was making. It's in Daniel chapter 6, verse 1 through 3. Darius divided his kingdom into 120 states and placed a governor in charge of each one. In order to make sure that his government was run properly, Darius put three other officials in charge of the governors. One of these officials was Daniel. And he did his work so much better than the other governors and officials that the king decided to let him govern the whole kingdom. Daniel set himself apart from all the other young men that were to rule over this country. He, as Jack Welch in the business world would say, he got out of the pile. There were a lot of people there, and, and he not only made a difference, but he became a difference maker. I can still remember in college, my freshman year, hearing the speaker say to us, that there are three questions, he said, that you need to ask yourself throughout your life. And if you can answer these three questions, I promise you, he said, your life will be full of passion and full of purpose. I want to give you those three questions because for almost 50 years now, those questions have stayed with me. The three questions are this. What do you sing about? In other words, what makes you happy? What do you cry about? What is it that saddens you when you think about it? And thirdly, what do you dream about? As I began to ask myself those questions throughout college and then the following years, I discovered that, that they began to bring passion out of my life. What made me happy? What made me sad? What did I want to become? What did I desire to, to be? What were my dreams in life? And then when I was 25, for Christmas, I received from my assistant a, a, a Christmas gift. It was a book. And when I opened it, the, the cover of the book said, the greatest story ever told. I thought, my gosh, I love to read the greatest story ever told. I can hardly wait to read this book. And I opened it up. And when I opened up the book, much to my surprise, the pages were blank. And I looked at her and I said, I don't get this, the greatest story ever told, and you know, the pages are blank. And she said, turn to the first page, and I did. And she had written this note to me on the first page. John, your life is before you. You fill these pages 
with your dreams, with your hopes, with matters of your heart. You write on these pages your story and make it the greatest story ever told. I took that book home, and the next morning I started writing on those blank pages. I've written a lot of books in my life, but this book is the most important book I ever wrote. It was never sold. It's just my book because it has my story. It has my dream. And the first morning, as I began to ask myself, what am I going to write on this blank page? I, I put the first words on the top page, I want to make a difference. Now, I didn't know what all that meant, but I knew how I felt when I wrote those words. I want to make a difference. And I began to write over the next few weeks on those pages until I filled the entire book out and I began to write my story. I began to put down in words my dream. A few years ago, I, I wrote a book called Put Your Dream to the Test. And basically, it's a book that helps people ask 10 questions to see if their dream is a valid dream, if they have the potential, the possibility of reaching that dream. And the first question on that, in that book, the first question that you ask that yourself is a very simple question. It's the ownership question. Is my dream really my dream? Because you see, it's possible for, it's even probable for, for young people to have someone else's dream. When I was young, I had my parents' dream. I mean, I can still remember when I was seven years old, they came to me and they thought that I was musically talented. And so they said, we want to give you piano lessons. And for the next step, seven years, I took piano lessons. And it, it was not my dream, and it was not my giftedness. I still remember going to my first piano recital, and I played my piece, and I thought it was pretty good. And then Elaine Mosley got up behind me, and she played the piece, and she hadn't been playing piano as long as I was, and hers was like three times better and harder than mine. And I could still remember saying to myself, this is not my gift. And my parents were so thrilled. They were clapping and cheering for me. And for seven years, I was, I was living their dream. And one day, I, you know, I had a, you know, a, a, a kind of a, like a come to Jesus meeting with my mom and dad. And Jesus really wasn't there, to be honest with you. And, and I just said, I, you know, this isn't, this isn't who I am. This isn't my dream. And, and they were wonderful. They said, hey, okay, I'll go find your dream. But it's possible, it's possible to have, you know, it's possible to be David with Saul's armor. It, it's possible to, to have someone else's dream. But here's what I believe about every one of you here today. I believe every one of you, regardless of where your dream is going to take you and what your dream is, I believe every one of you would truly like to make a positive difference in your life. You would like to make your life count. And I want you to look at your neighbor, the one you're sitting beside right now, and, and say to them, even you can make a positive difference. Go ahead and tell them that, would you? Okay, okay. It's obvious to me, it's, it's obvious to me that you not only looked at the person you're sitting beside and say, oh, you, you know, even you can make a positive difference, it's obvious to me that you are trying to help them to know what they needed to do to make a positive difference. And I would like to, I would like to share with you how you can become a difference maker in your life. Three simple thoughts, and, and these three simple thoughts will, will get you on the way to getting to your dream and making a positive difference in society. And the first one is very simple, stay close to people who are making a difference. If you really want to make a positive difference, you got to hang around other people that are making a positive difference. In 1974, Charles Tremendous Jones said to me, John, he said, who you are and what you're going to become in the next five years are going to depend on the people you spend time with and the books that you read. Jim Collins calls this who luck. 
He says we all want luck in our life, but the most important luck that you and I can have is who luck, who we're hanging around with, who we meet. And he said, if, if you've got good who luck, then it, it's going it to greatly empower and, and, and benefit, benefit your life. Mark Cole, who's the CEO of, of my companies, he, he calls this the proximity principle. It, it's a principle that he says, basically, he kind of takes it from Elijah and Elisha. You just got to get around people that are making a difference and, and let that mantle, let that spirit, let that environment begin to envelop you until you begin to make a difference in your life also. When I teach in the business community, I teach a networking question, which is maybe the most important question I teach, and that is, who do you know that I should know? And I tell them, any time that you're talking to somebody that, that has influence or that's done something wonderful, ask them, who do you know that, that I should know? And that brings me to today, where I am, Liberty University. It brings me to Elmer Towns, who has mentored me since 1974. He wrote a book when I was just a young pastor called The Ten Largest Churches in America. I was in a little church in southern Indiana called Hillham. You've never been to Hillham. You've never heard of Hillham. You don't want to go to Hillham. I mean, Hillham is what, was it, what had uh, what, 11 houses, a garage, and a country store. The first Sunday that Margaret and I were there, we only had three people in church, and two of them were Margaret and me. And the old lady who lived right beside the church. But I had a dream. I had a desire to make a difference. And so we started building that little church, and we were running about 30 or 40. And I read his book on the largest churches in America. Now, these churches were huge. I had a little tiny country church, and I got the names of those 10 pastors, and I got the idea that I would call them and I would ask them, ask them for an interview that I, so I could ask them some questions about how they built their church. And so I worked hard, got the numbers, called these pastors. They are all nice to me. And I knew they didn't know who I was, and so I'm a kid, and I'm saying, how can I get their attention? So I, in my question of would you, would you see me for 30 minutes, I offered to give them $100. Now, $100, that was back in, that was back in 19, 1970, 71. And I was making about $5,000 a year, so 100 bucks was a lot of money to me. And, but, but I wanted so desperately to have a 30-minute interview, would you just see me? And, and two of the 10 said they would. And so, those two that said they would, I, I, I went to them on the appointed time, and I had, now get it, I get 30 minutes of time with them, and I have five legal pages of questions. And, and, and I get my tape recorder, and I turn it on, and, and, and I start asking the questions, and, and I'm only maybe in, in five or six questions, 30 minutes are up, and I stop and reach in, get my check and, to give them the hundred dollars. And, and the two that saw me, neither one of them would, would, took my money. And in fact, both of them, it happened to be right on lunch. They said, do you want to go to lunch with me? And I said, yes. And I don't know if you've ever eaten lunch with your hero, but if you do, when you, when you put the food in your mouth, it, it doesn't go down. And so I just shift the food around a little bit more and ask them some more questions. And both of those pastors, after lunch, took me back to their office, and they laid hands on me, and they prayed over me. And I went out to my little Volkswagen car in the parking lot, threw my briefcase in the back seat, and sat in the driver's seat and put my head against the steering wheel and bawled like a baby. And I said, God, if you could do that for them, could you do that for me? I had just been close to a great man of God. I had just been close to somebody who was making a difference, and I could feel that spirit begin to come over me as they would pray for me. One of those two pastors that was willing to see me was your founder here at Liberty, Jerry Falwell. He was one of the two that said, John, I would, I would be glad to see you. He didn't know me. He didn't know me from Adam, but he gave me that time, and he prayed over me, and he said something to me that day that changed my life. I'm just a kid, but I'm around someone who has the spirit of greatness and God on them, 
And he looked at me and he said these words, John, he said, do so, something so big with your life that people who know you will say, I know John Maxwell. He's not that good. Only God could do that in his life. And that day, and that day, Dr. Falwell sowed in me the seed of what I now talk about and teach all over the world, the God room seed. I'll come back to that in a little bit later in my lesson. But he's the one who planted the seed for that me in my life to be sure that I had God room. And every time I would get around one of these leaders, well, any time I get around somebody that was doing something big or special, if they were a person of faith, I would, I would just say, would you mind just laying your hands on me and, and praying over me? Because my, my father, who is still living, almost 97 years of age, as a very young man, he had said, son, he said, make sure that great men lay hands on you and pray over you so that you can get some of their spirit, some of that mantle. It's the proximity principle I'm talking about. And if you really want to make a difference in your life, you just got to get around those kind of people. And, and you can't meet them all. I started by reading their books. I started by any way that I possibly could to get close enough to them to be able to catch the success principles and, 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 and the spirit of those great people that it could begin to change my life. So that's, that's number one. Just, just get close to people that are already making a difference and it will help you to make a big difference in your life. Number two, be intentional in making a difference. I want to challenge you today to be very intentional in, in, in making a difference, and, and there's a reason for that, and I want to just take a moment and I want to give you a visual so that, so that we make sure that we have this today in the assembly. So just take a moment and, and look at me because I, I want you to see something and then I want to just talk about it for just, just, for, I just, just for a moment. Everything worthwhile is uphill. It's the greatest life lesson I could teach you. Everything. Everything that's going to be worthwhile in your life, it's all uphill. Your dreams, they're all uphill. If you ever have a great relationship, it's all uphill. Getting through Liberty University, it's all uphill. Everything, everything worthwhile, everything worthwhile is uphill. And that's why you and I need to be intentional. Because you only go uphill if you're intentional. You see, most people, they don't lead their life. Most people accept their life. And everything that you want, the dreams, the hopes, the make it difference part of your life, everything, it's all uphill. That no one has ever spoken, no successful person has ever spoken or written a book on accidental accomplishments. It's all intentional. If you interview a successful person who's on the top of their game, and they're on the top of their mountain, and, they, and you ask them, how did you get there? Never has anybody been asked, how did you get on top of your mountain? No one has ever been asked that question and kind of look kind of quizzically and say, I have no idea. Gosh. I just woke up. Here I am, amazing. <laughs> you see, the dream is free, but the journey isn't. It's all uphill. And the reason we need to be intentional in making a difference is making a difference is not easy, doesn't come quickly. You see, here's our challenge. We have uphill hopes, and 
and downhill habits. And you can't go uphill with downhill habits. And the only way that you and I can ever achieve the potential that we have, the God-given potential. You see, your potential is God's gift to you. What you do with that potential is your gift back to God. None of us can achieve that unless we're intentional. And I want you to be intentional in three areas. Let me give them to you quickly. The three areas that I want you to be intentional in is in your personal development and growth. My life was totally changed, totally changed. In my young 20s, when Kurt Kantmeyer was having breakfast with me, and he asked me after I graduated from college my, with my first degree, he asked me, he said, John, what is, your, uh, what, what is your personal growth plan? Well, I didn't have one. I, I, I didn't know I was supposed to have one. No one had ever told me I had a personal growth plan. I, I graduated from college. I was in my first year of, of, of ministry, and I was just working hard. I didn't know I was supposed to have a personal growth plan. And, and when I told him I really didn't have one, he, he said these words that just changed my life. He said, John, growth is not an automatic process. You don't grow automatically. If you grow, you've got to grow on purpose. I went to my friends. I went around to, probably for the next six months. I said, do you have a growth plan? No, no, no. 300 friends. No one, no one had a personal growth plan. And I kept thinking of those words. It, it, it's not an accident. You've got to be intentional. It's, it's all uphill. You've got to have a growth plan. I developed a growth plan. I've developed a growth plan back in my 20s, and I have a growth plan that I've used throughout my life. And at 71, I still have a, a personal growth plan that, that, you know, see, the only guarantee that tomorrow is going to get better is that you're growing today. It's the only guarantee. So when I was young and I got on my growth plan, I heard Earl Nightingale say that if you spend one hour a day, every day, on a certain subject for five years, you'll become an expert on the subject. And leadership was my love as a very young man. I thought, I would love to be an expert on leadership. And Earl Nightingale says if I spend one hour a day, every day on the subject of leadership in five years, I can become an expert. And so I began that, that journey, that five-year journey. And so I talked to leaders. I read what I could on leadership. I practiced leadership. I did every, every day, leadership, leadership, leadership. And every day I would ask, me, ask myself this question, how long will it take? How long will it take? Well, how long will it take? Well, Earl Nightingale said five years. So when I finished the first year, well, I got four years. Now, now I've got three years. And I'm doing a countdown. I'm, I'm thinking I'm Cape Canaveral. How long will it take? How long will it take? And about halfway into my five-year journey, one day I stopped asking the question, how long will it take? because something happened within me. I began to internally be transformed and changed from the growth that I was getting in my life. And I can still remember the day I quit asking, how long will it take? And I started asking, how far can I go? Wow. How far? Can I go? The reason I'm so excited about being here in convocation with you today is because I look at you as students and I just look at you and I ask myself, how far, how far can they go? That student that you're sitting beside right now, you have no idea the God-given potential with them. How far can you go? go. All I'm trying to do today is put some seeds of success within you, deposit those in your life so that you can go as far as you possibly can. You want to be intentional in your growth. You want to be intentional in your giftedness. When you find your strength, you want to stay in that zone and work it and cultivate it. And you want to be intentional in your significance. I wrote a book three years ago called Intentional Living. Somebody says, John, what is the book that I, you think can make the most impact on people? I think probably that's the one. And intentional living is all about how to live a life of significance. Now, let me give you the difference between success and significance. Success is all about you. It's about your career, what you do, taking care of your family, your homes, what, the, the, your, your, your salary. Success is all about stuff that, that you can put uh, you know, kind of under your name. And, and, and so success is all about you, and significance is all about others. Significance is all about what you do for others, how you make a difference in their life that truly makes a difference. 
And again, it's all uphill. Everything's uphill because I'm talking now about adding value to people. And it's not natural for us to add value to people. We basically want people to add value to us. We want everyday people to make our day. And it's all about intentionally adding value to other people. And we always have to go uphill because we're all naturally selfish. I'm selfish, you're selfish, we're all selfish. If, if you don't think you really are, sometimes when I get with Christians, I got to help kind of break the glass for them because they all feel a little bit more spiritual than they really are. If you don't think you're selfish, just let me ask you a question. When you're in a group picture, <laughs> I see the train of coming. When you're in a group picture, you look at it for the first time. Just let me ask you a very simple question. Who is the first person that you look for? And if you look good, if you look good, what do you do? You say, great picture, great picture, great picture. send it to me. Okay, okay, okay. Send it. And if, if you're not good, come on, do it again, do it again. Another picture, another picture. Another. The great picture all depends on how you look. I would encourage you to be intentional in your growth, in your giftedness, and in significance. And that's how you'll make a difference because it's uphill all the way. Okay, we've done two. I got one more. Get, get close to people, the proximity principle. Get around people that are making a difference. Birds of a feather flock together. N number two, without any question, you, 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 you want to be intentional because this is not going to be an, a, a quick route, a, a shortcut. It's all a pill. And the third thing I want to share with you is this. Have a vision gap. I'll explain vision gap in a moment. Have a vision gap that stretches you to make a difference. A vision gap is the space between what you are doing now and what you could be doing. A friend Chris Hodges taught me that. A vision gap is the space between what I'm doing now and what I could be doing. And it's in this vision gap, that as you begin to close that gap, that you really begin to do significant things that really make a difference in the lives of people. And let me just share, suggest with you two ways to kind of close that vision gap in your life. Number one, ask God to connect you with the right people. We've kind of talked about that. That's that proximity principle again. But ask God to connect you with, with the people who want to make a difference. In 1983, when I began to see that vision gap was pretty big in my life, I began to ask God to help me and bring people into my life that would make a difference. And He began to bring people into my life that would make a difference that have helped me. And, and together we've done some pretty amazing things. I can still remember when I started Equip and I had this dream of, of training a million leaders worldwide. And I sat down with about 500 real great key leaders. And I asked them if they would help me, and they said yes. And over the next 19 years, these 500 people took 4,500 trips around the world, spent, went 36 million miles, taught 180 million leadership lessons, and we didn't train 1 million, we trained 5 million people. And it's all because I asked people to help me, and I got people that really wanted to make a difference to come on the team. The second thing, though, to close that vision gap is to ask God to do for you what you cannot do for yourself. This is back to Dr. Falwell planting the seed in my life when I was in my 20s. John, he said, do something so big that when people see it, they'll say, I know you, Maxwell. You're not that good. Only God could do that. I want to challenge each one of you to ask God to truly do something for you that you can't do for yourself. You see, I call that God room. God room is the space between what you can do and what only God can do. And Ephesians chapter 3 verse 20 is the passage. God can do anything far more than you can ever imagine or guess or request in your wildest dreams. He does it not by pushing us around, but by working within us, His Spirit deeply and gently within us. You see, God's room, my gosh, He can do anything. It, it's, it's staggering, it's unlimited, but it's personal. 
So eight years ago, after we trained five million leaders in every country of the world, I asked God for a, a, a bigger thing. I, I said, God, I would like to see a country transformed in my lifetime. And so we began to strategically look around the world and, and ask where we would go, and we determined we would only go by the invitation of the president of a country, and we started with Guatemala. We went next to Paraguay. We went, we went to Costa Rica. We're, we're working now with those three countries. We have 22 presidents of countries now asking us to come in and do transformation. We teach leadership values in roundtables in Guatemala alone now. We have over a half a million people going through roundtables on leadership values. And when people learn values and live values, they become more valuable. Everything begins to change. On Easter weekend this year, I was invited by the king to go to Saudi Arabia, and I spent time with the royal family because they're wanting to do transformation in that country, and I was able to spend three days with them. I'll go in a few days to Kenya to be with the president of Kenya, and, and we're finding countries are really wanting to have change. They're wanting to have transformation, and it's becoming amazing. In fact, I'll go to Guatemala in about another month. And I'll speak at that time to 36,000 leaders. Now, I live in a secular world. You have to understand, 90% of where I am is not in, a, in an arena like this. 90% of the time I'm in, in the business community. And so we have these facilitators. We have 100,000 facilitators that facilitate roundtables in Guatemala. And so we'll go down and we'll train 36,000 new ones. And we'll spend the time training them how to lead people into, into expressing and learning these good values. And then when I'm done with the training, I share with them that, that I have one more thing to share, but, but, but it has nothing to do with the program. It just has something to do with my personal faith. And I tell them I would like to talk to them about my relationship with God, but I want it to be voluntary. So I, I dismiss them and say, in 15 minutes, if you want to, you can come back and I'll teach you the four pictures of God. It'll only take me 10 minutes but I'll teach you how to connect with God. Ninety percent of the people that I dismiss come back to hear the four pictures of God. So it, when, we go to, when we go to Guatemala and I speak to 36,000 leaders, 32,000 of those leaders will come back to hear me talk about the four pictures of God. And of the 32,000 that will come back, I mean, we've now been doing this for years. Half of those people, 16,000 of those people, basically out of the business community, very little church affiliation at all, half of them, 16,000 people, will receive Christ as Savior. It's the most amazing experience to see these people just, once they see how they can have a relationship with God, so readily want to have that. And I'm going to just, uh, just give you a little challenge here for a moment, because when I go down, we, we always give a, a leadership Bible to the, them, because again, many of them don't come from a church at all. So those who come forward, so we'll give out 16,000 leadership Bibles. And, and they're going to put something on the, uh, you know, they said at Liberty we could do this. If you, you could help us out with this vision. For five dollars, you could buy a Bible that we could give away in Guatemala in about, literally in about six weeks. And I would, when we give them away, I, I, I would be glad to say, you know, the, the students at Liberty are providing this Bible for you today. And I don't know if they're going to put it on the screen for you or, uh, of how that you can do this, but, but I want you to be able to, uh, to, to be a part of it. What, what are we, do we have it on the screen or what? No? Oh, is it up? Oh, it'll be there. Okay. The, the, this, this is people space, waiting for the, it to be there, okay? That's okay, because this adds to the drama. Uh, in fact, this is amazing, because now you're getting your phones ready, because you're going to, five dollars. In fact, while you're waiting for it to come up there, look at your neighbor and say, you should give five bucks to somebody that needs Jesus. Go ahead and tell them that right now. You should give five bucks to somebody. Okay, are you going to do that? Okay. And when you were telling the person they should give five bucks to help somebody that just finds Jesus, did you ask them to loan you five so you could do it also? Okay. There's 20. There oh, here we go. All right. Thank you, Jerry. 
See, thank you. If, if, in fact, probably if we wouldn't have had this time for the, not, the number not to get up there, I probably wouldn't have gotten 20 bucks from him. You know what I'm saying? Take your time. Maybe I can get 100 from him. Go ahead. Uh, anyway, I'm get, you're, you're going to have to talk to me for a moment. Are they going to get the number? Okay, they will. Okay, now, okay, I would like to do one more thing and then I'm done. Because, and, and this is the most important thing, if you would allow me. First of all, I want to thank you for being so beautifully receptive to the teaching, and, and you're just a, a, an incredible group of people, and you're at a, a phenomenal school that I greatly support. My son went here, my granddaughter Hannah will be coming next year here, and, and, and Liberty University is, is the school. I, I love you. I, I, I love what Jerry Jr., Becky, and all of them are doing in leadership, and, and I just, I really want you to know that this is such a good place. When you go to heaven, you're going to want to come home on the weekends. Some of you. Here's what I want to do in closing today. I'd like to pray over you. If you just bow your heads with me for a moment. This morning as I was just kind of getting ready to share with you, as you were doing that, I, um, I sensed that I should pray over you and ask God to give you a spiritual gift of leadership. I shared with you that I have had great men lay their hands on me, and it's made a significant impact and difference in my life. And you are just beautiful kids, and you want to make a difference, and you got a heart for God. If you would like for me to just ask God to give you a spiritual gift of leadership so that you could influence many for the kingdom. This isn't Simon Says, not everybody has to stand. Don't feel any, don't, the only people I want to stand are the kids who say, I want this leadership gift in my life so that I can make an impact for God. Your founder would constantly say at this university, he wanted to raise up champions for Christ. If you're gonna be a champion for Christ, that's a leadership thing. And I would just love, I'd be honored to pray with you. So if you would like to receive today, and be prayed over to receive the gift of leadership, if you'll just raise your hand. Just stand up, that's right, just stand up. Father, I wanna thank you today for the students who are standing right now in your presence. It, your heart has to be glad because you're always looking for a man or woman to stand in the gap. And here there are thousands of kids who are just standing up and saying, I would like to receive a spiritual leadership gift from you, Father, so that I could make a difference and make my life really count for the things that are eternal. And Jesus, you said that if our earthly father knows how to give good gifts to us, how much more will our heavenly father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask? We ask. We come very humbly, but we come with anticipation that today in the lives of many of these young students, you're going to plant this gift within them, and they're going to sense they're not the same as they once were. That they're going to have a passion, a mission, a purpose, a commitment to make a difference. So I reach my hand out to them. I reach my hand out to them in your name, Father. And I ask just now, in the quietness of this moment, you would visit them and that you would give them a spiritual gift of leadership, not for themselves, but for thy kingdom. Your kingdom come, your will be done. Take 30 more seconds, would you please? And lay hands upon the person right beside you and just pray a blessing over them. Would you do that? Just, just pray a blessing right over them right now. Ask God to help them. Ask God to help them make a difference 
in their life. Just pray right over them right now. Ask God to help them make a difference in their life. In Jesus' name, and everybody said, hey, I love you.